When the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, better known as NATO, formed in 1949, its founding document did not specify who could join and who could not. There was no need. Everyone understood that the collective defense that was its primary goal was that of the United States and its European allies, to the exclusion of the Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc allies, who would later form their own rival organization, the Warsaw Pact. In 2022, the United States invited a number of allies to join it in establishing a new organization dedicated to a different type of security, the Minerals Security Partnership, or MSP. Like NATO, the MSP is dedicated to an ethos to bolster critical mineral supply chains essential for the clean energy transition. Like NATO, it doesn't state which countries are eligible for membership and which are not. And like NATO, it doesn't need to, because it is quite clearly to the exclusion of certain countries, namely China, as well as Russia. Although China has a lot of mining activity, most of the critical minerals essential to green energy technologies are mined in other resource-rich countries. However, refining and processing of these minerals is dominated by China, which refines 100% of the world's natural graphite, about 95% of all manganese, 85% of rare earths, 75% of cobalt, 69% of nickel, 44% of lithium, and 40% of copper, to name the most important critical minerals. China is also the undisputed world leader at turning these minerals into finished products. For example, it produces around 78% of the cathodes and 85% of the anodes that go into battery cells, and 70% of the battery cells themselves, which then go into the battery packs used in electric vehicles. It also produces around 95% of permanent magnets made from rare earths, which, among their many uses, are essential to converting energy from the spinning blades of wind turbines into electricity. What Chinese companies can't source from mines in mainland China, they source from other countries, some of which they are increasingly at odds with from a geopolitical perspective. For example, Tianqi Lithium, one of China's two giant lithium chemical refiners, is the majority owner of an Australian registered company that owns a 51% share of the Greenbushes mine in Western Australia, the world's largest hard rock lithium mine. Tianqi also has a 24% stake in Chile's SQM, which is second in the world for lithium mine production. In both cases, Tianqi secured financing from the state-owned China Development Bank to help outbid its rivals, including US headquartered Albemarle, which just happens to be the world's largest lithium miner and the junior partner to Tianqi at the Greenbushes mine. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, China Moliko acquired one of the world's largest cobalt mines and later one of the world's largest undeveloped cobalt deposits from American mining company Freeport McMoran, without a word from either the Obama or Trump administrations at the time. When it comes to certain critical minerals, Chinese refiners haven't had to go to the trouble of acquiring the mines. For example, because the United States currently has zero rare earth processing capacity, the owner of the sole US rare earth mine, Mountain Pass in California, sells all the minerals it produces to Chinese companies. This situation is now viewed with alarm in Washington due to the use of rare earths in American-made military hardware, including F-35 fighter jets, as I covered in detail in another recent video. For a long time, China increased its control over the supply of critical minerals without any comment from Washington. It was a convenient arrangement for both sides. Chinese companies were capable of refining, processing and manufacturing products from these minerals at a far lower cost than anywhere else, benefiting American and Western consumers. Additionally, refining, processing and smelting of metals is very energy intensive, far more than the mining of the raw materials themselves. For example, aluminium or aluminum, another critical mineral dominated by China, is estimated to contribute around 3% of direct CO2 emissions worldwide. By offshoring much of the production to Chinese firms, the United States could write these emissions off as an externality, allowing China to shoulder more of the blame for climate change while enjoying the end product itself. But that was then and this is now, with the US and China increasingly viewing each other as adversaries and a bipartisan consensus arising in Washington on the need to decouple from China. The US and its allies have also taken note of how Russia has used its control of natural gas supply to Europe as a political lever during the war in Ukraine, and they worry China could do the same in the event a war breaks out over, say, Taiwan. The United States and partner countries announced the establishment of the Mineral Security Partnership at PDAC, the largest annual mining convention in the world, in Toronto, Canada, in June 2022. Notably, the MSP's founding partners comprise countries that collectively have the ability to control complete critical minerals value chains. Australia and Canada, and to a lesser extent, Sweden, Finland and Norway, have an abundance of critical minerals mines and deposits. Japan and South Korea are the closest competitors to China in terms of mineral refining, processing and manufacturing, and the United States and the Nordic countries 
also have some midstream production capacity. And the US, Japan, South Korea, United Kingdom, France, and Germany, as well as the European Commission, which also had a seat at the table, represent many of the big players at the end of these value chains, including automakers, renewable energy technology firms, and defense companies. The MSP convened for a second time on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly meeting in New York in September 2022. This time, additional mineral-rich countries, most of them politically unaligned to either the United States or to China, were in attendance as observers, namely Argentina, Brazil, the DRC, Mongolia, Mozambique, Namibia, Tanzania, and Zambia. Together, the countries that participated in this meeting have 24 to 68% of the known underground reserves, reserves being the economically viable portion of mineral resource, for the most important critical minerals. The Mineral Security Partnership is effectively a practical implementation of an increasingly popular idea in Washington known as friendshoring. Friendshoring, as US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen defined it in a conversation with Canada's Deputy Prime Minister in 2022, is the idea that countries that espouse a common set of values about trade and conduct in the global economy should get the benefits of that trade so they have multiple sources of supply and are not overly reliant on sourcing critical goods from countries with which they have geopolitical concerns. The United States and its closest allies have put these principles into action, both inside and outside of the MSP framework. In May 2022, the US Department of Defense asked Congress to amend the Cold War era Defense Production Act, which provides funding for facilities in the United States and Canada to allow it to also fund critical minerals projects on the soil of its two partners in the AUKUS Security Pact, Australia and the United Kingdom. And in November 2022, Canada ordered three Chinese companies to divest their holdings in Canadian lithium, tantalum, and cesium projects, citing national security concerns. As mentioned, the United States wants to involve a broader group of countries in its minerals security partnership, many of which don't currently have a strong preference for either side in the increasingly tense geopolitical competition between the US and China. For this reason, the US understands it must present a compelling case for why it and its core MSP allies should be alternative downstream partners to China. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken outlined this case in the September 2022 meeting with the extended group of mineral producing countries. Critical mineral supply chains are simply vital to our future, he said, adding that to ensure these technologies can be deployed quickly, countries have to come together to build resilient, diverse and secure critical mineral supply chains. Without mentioning specific examples, he said that too often the relationships between minerals producers on the one hand and minerals purchasing countries on the other have been extractive and left behind environmental issues while delivering few economic benefits. Blinken made a pledge to break this cycle through meaningful collaboration, declaring that minerals rich countries should benefit from all stages of the value chain, from extraction to processing to recycling. Blinken's speech was light on details of how this would be achieved, but he promised that the US or partner countries would help reduce the risk of critical minerals projects by providing loan guarantees or debt financing, or by connecting local mining companies with the US private sector. It remains to be seen whether the Mineral Security Partnership will morph into something much bigger than it started as, like NATO, which began as a group of just 12 nations and now include 30 members, including many former Eastern Bloc countries, but is still notably opposed to Russia, the successor to the Soviet Union. What is clear is that the big geopolitical contest of the 21st century will involve not only a battle of strength in economic, military or cyber terms, but also a battle for control over mineral resource value chains. And that means that mineral-rich countries that aren't currently in bed with either China or the United States may find themselves having to lean to one side or the other. I'm Nadav for Mining the World. If you enjoyed this video, please help me promote this channel by hitting the like button and wherever you are in this mineral-rich world of ours. Thank you.